So hello everyone. Uh, as you'll see on your uh, at the top of the screen, there's an announcement that uh, the meeting is being recorded. So um, you can press dismiss if you don't want to keep looking at the notification, but please don't press stop recording in the in the drop down list because that will stop the recording uh, altogether. Um, so only the notification where it says dismiss, you can press that one. So welcome to the launch of the Irish Buddhist, the forgotten monk who faced down the British Empire. I will first hand you over to the head of the study of religions department, uh, Dr. Amanola de Sandi, um, and uh, then I will introduce you to our uh, our speakers this evening. Thanks, Jenny. Um, I hope everybody can hear me. Um, this is just a very quick uh, welcome to everybody to the study of religions department. We um, all of us are are quite excited about this book launch and um, uh, this book, this wonderful book, uh, the Irish Buddhist, the forgotten monk who faced down the British Empire written um, by Brian, Alicia and Lawrence, but we're especially excited to welcome back Brian Bocking, who is our Professor Emeritus from our department. So a very warm welcome back, Brian, and it's great to see you. Um, it's a shame that during the pandemic we are having to do this virtually, but we've got a, a great number of people here, so it should um, be a good conversation. Um, and I hope it is um, a great conversation on the Irish Buddhist. So I'm going to hand you back to Jenny. Thank you very much. Thanks, Aman. So as uh, Aman mentioned, one of the co-authors is uh, Professor Brian Bocking, who's our former head of, of study of religions and a founding member of our uh, department here in um, University College Cork or virtually in, in University College Cork. Uh, and also a founding member of the Irish Society for the, the Academic Study of Religions. So um, Brian has been uh, extremely significant in our field uh, in, in Ireland and in, in developing um, our, our wider uh, discipline. And uh, I'd like to um, introduce you also to the, the uh, other authors, uh, co-authors, Dr. Alicia Turner, who's Associate Professor of Humanities and Religious Studies in York University, and Dr. Lawrence Cox, Associate Professor of Sociology in Maynooth University. And the, um, I was going to uh, read the points of the, you know, the, the Oxford University Press um, blurb, uh, but I will, I will leave all of that to, to, to you in your, in your presentation. So, uh, we will have, um, we will take questions. Um, at, in a, a question and answer session. Um, so if you take note of your questions, you can chat if, if you can see the chat, um, the chat box function. And uh, I will take note of the order in which the questions are asked or there's a hand symbol. Um, so when we come to the, the, the Q&A um, and the discussion afterwards, you can you can press the hand symbol if you want to uh, ask a question. Um, so please remember to, to keep your microphones on mute during the, the presentation. So I'll pass you okay, on Jenny. to Brian. OK, hello. Thanks. Thanks very much for that introduction and, and welcome, uh, Aman and uh, Jenny. Um, I, can you hear me? Yes, good. OK, um, so thanks to everyone also who's uh, tuned in tonight. Um, I've seen a few familiar faces. I'm sure there are others. Uh, unfortunately, all I can see on the screen is is um, one person in, in the corner and uh, sometimes me and uh, the, the slides that I'm going to show you. Um, this is really um, a, a celebration of a book. Um, it's required three authors. It really couldn't have been, been written by one person, as you'll realise if you read it. But there are also many, many more, including I'm sure many who are here tonight, who've helped uh, in this book, in creating this book over the last 10 or 11 years. Um, we, we've got, uh, they're, they're far too numerous to mention. They know who they are, but we, we have in the acknowledgements, we have a list of 150 people. Um, so, and I hope we haven't left anybody out. 
Uh, and you really do have our grateful thanks for all the all the all the um, help that we've received. So I'm going to speak very briefly. This is really a celebration. Um, it's not um, intended as a, a very sort of demanding seminar where we test you at the end on the content. Um, it's a celebration of um, a book which has uh, had a really quite extraordinary um, trajectory uh, and has been great fun. And uh, I'm going to speak very briefly about the uh, origins of the book and also say a few words about uh, Damaloka's trial for sedition, which took place almost exactly 110 years ago in Burma. And then I'm going to hand over to Alicia and then Lawrence, who are going to speak again briefly uh, about some of the themes and events covered in the book. And then Jenny, as she said, will host a Q&A session with the authors. So without further ado, and I am going to go through the slides quite quickly. So, uh, you know, in the modern style, uh, requiring a short attention span. Um, oh, no, they're not working. OK. Ah, OK, so when I first arrived in um, UCC, I became interested in the fact that there didn't seem to be very much study of religions, plural, in Ireland. And uh, so I started to look uh, idly for examples of, of um, religiosity and spirituality and so on, which went beyond what I call the binary division. And that division takes many forms, but uh, the most obvious one is Christian and non-Christian. So, you know, Christianity gets a lot of study, but non-Christian religions didn't. Um, Catholic versus almost everything else. Ireland versus places outside Ireland. Um, Orthodox, I don't mean that in the technical sense, but Orthodox religion, you know, sort of mainstream religion versus experimental forms. Um, remembered religions versus forgotten religions and successful religions versus failed religions and so on. And I thought it would be interesting to look because um, in my experience, the, the more you look, the more you find. Oh, there's a few people who couldn't uh, be with us tonight who wanted to um, uh, just uh, sort of endorse the book, really. And that there's there's our future, well, not our, but the American future vice president. Um, when I came to UCC, I think uh, Dermot Keogh in the history department has already produced a book on um, Jews in 20th century Ireland. Um, since then, we've had uh, a couple of very important books, Lawrence's Buddhism in Ireland and Oliver Sharbrot and others um, produced Muslims in Ireland. And um, there are many other projects underway and there are, there are books which are either in gestation or about to come out or have come out in different areas. But um, these are uh, the, some significant ones, particularly the... Uh, the second. Oh, there's a couple of other people that uh, wanted to um, just just uh, sort of say how happy they are that the Irish Buddhist has come out. Um, as Jenny mentioned, the Journal of the Irish Society of the Academic Study of Religions is where you'll find all the um, reports of work in progress um, and research underway uh, in amongst uh, scholars in Ireland and elsewhere. Uh, and that's a free open access journal, which uh, the, the department uh, in UCC hosts. And it's been a very important forum. And it's the journal of the Irish Society for the Academic Study of Religions, which was founded in the morning of Damaloka Day. And Damaloka Day was held in February, sorry, February 2011, about uh, 18 months into our research on Damaloka. Now, um, just to run through a few of those sort of forgotten, uh, forgotten or remembered or misremembered examples. Um, Max Arthur McAuliffe, very famous scholar of Sikhism. Uh, most people think he was English, but he's Irish. And on the right, uh, top right, you can see the moment when um, Tyg Foley, Professor Tyg Foley of Galway, stood up in Damaloka Day and said, has anyone heard of Max Arthur McAuliffe? And uh, I think one person had. Um, we got together afterwards and uh, the rest is history. And, and there's a book uh, which will come out fairly soon, I hope. Annie Besant, a famous name, um, but uh, not, not everyone realises she was Irish. She wasn't really. She was born in London, but it's kind of Irish city. And her father was a TCD graduate. Her mother was Irish Catholic. She was the president of the Theosophical Society. She became president of the Indian National Congress. Very remarkable woman. Uh, oh, there's another um, uh, individual who's found the book interesting. Um, Yeats, you've probably heard of. He's a poet and uh, also, um, more importantly, perhaps for our purposes, was a member of the Theosophical Society and uh, particularly uh, later on the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn. Um, less known, perhaps, but not in her time. She was extremely well known. Sister Nivedita, um, who was born in uh, Tyrone. And uh, she was a devotee of Swami Vivekananda, 
who was the um, acknowledged star of the 1893 uh, Chicago World's Parliament of Religions. Um, and George Townsend, um, probably not so well known, but he will be uh, fairly soon, I think. Um, he was the, the sort of right hand man of Shoghi Effendi. And uh, he, he's been brought to our attention by uh, Brendan McNamara. And there's a picture of Brendan there on the right with Oliver Sharbrot at Damaloka Day. And there's Brendan's book, which is probably out in time for Christmas, I hope. Um, but they're also completely forgotten figures, um, which ha it's been possible to rediscover them through digital humanities research. And I'll just mention a couple of them. Um, one is Charles Founds, um, Japanologist and the first Buddhist missionary to London. And I'm not going to say uh, very much at all about Charles Founds. No doubt to the great relief of my former colleagues in the department, because I did rather go on about him. Um, that's his leaflet for the Buddhist Propagation Society in London, founded in 1889, and that is 20 years earlier than what most people think of as the first Buddhist mission to London. And he's completely forgotten, uh, or was completely forgotten. There's quite a bit about him now. And the person we're going to talk about tonight, the Irish Buddhist, is uh, Damaloka. Um, and uh, most of what we say will, will be about him. He's a, a working castle plebeian atheist, a temperance campaigner, he was a publisher, an orator, educator, traveller, an anti-colonial uh, agitator, and uh, a, a really remarkable career, and, it, and it's uh, covered, uh, you know, a, tw um, a dozen different areas of the world, and uh, we've, we've tried to track him down uh, as, as, as hard as we can, and, and it's taken the three of us 10 years, and all those other 150 people as well. So how did the Damaloka project begin? Well, um, uh, this is me at work in August 2009, um, when I had a few days off from, from my toils at UCC. And I was, um, I had one job left before I could sort of relax, and that was um, to review a book called Casting Faiths, um, which was about the transformation of religion in East and Southeast Asia. And there's a chapter in that book by uh, Russian scholar Alexei Kirichenko, a very good chapter about the, the, the way in which really Buddhism gets conceived of as a religion um, and, and increasingly as a sort of world religion. Uh, and he's talking about Burma. And in there is um, a reference to a Mr. Colvin, an Irish ordained into the Sangha, the congregation as Udamaloka. And when I saw that, I thought, well, that's interesting because I had absolutely no idea that there was any Ir there, there were any Irishmen um, involved in Burma at this period. In fact, I knew nothing at all about it. Um, and there's a footnote. And um, this footnote of the project, because uh, when he said I got this from Alicia, Alicia Turner, I didn't know who Alicia was. I googled her and I, I got the most likely candidate. And it, and it was true. It was her. And we had some correspondence over the summer or sort of September, October. Um, and Alicia, who's an expert on Burma, knew, knew quite a bit about uh, this guy Colvin and Damaloka, and she'd read some accounts from him in the newspaper, but no idea about, you know, who he was, where he came from and so forth. And then in October the 30th, along with um, Oliver and James and a couple of, couple of others, we went to the NUIG and I met for the first time that evening, I met in person Lawrence Cox, whom I didn't know. Um, and uh, I said to Lawrence, have you come across um, an Irish Buddhist called, called Damaloka or Mr. Colvin? And he said, he said, yes, uh, Damaloka, yes, he said, but it's Lawrence O'Rourke. And I said, no, no, it's Mr. Colvin. Anyway, we discussed it for a while and, he, and we realized we were talking about the same person with two different aliases. And the extraordinary thing is, and this still makes the back of the, the, the hair on the back of my neck stand on end, um, Lawrence said, I have literally just today sent off my first research article called Lawrence O'Rourke Damaloka uh, to the Journal of Global Buddhism. And I said, well, this is remarkable because here we, and, and Lawrence had found Damaloka not in Burmese newspapers, but in um, Western atheist and radical uh, press. And I said, well, this is remarkable. This is someone who's got an international reach. No one's ever heard of him. He's a Buddhist, he's a radical and so forth. And, uh, you know, let's contact Alicia. So our, this is the actual email from 30th of October 2009, 7.13 in the evening. This is me writing to Alicia 
and, and saying, I've just met Lawrence Cox, and uh, he'd be keen to collaborate on a further article. Well, the article's just come out as a book um, 10 years later. So in February 20, 2011, as I said, about 18 months after we'd started this, um, we had Damaloka Day, um, and 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 um, oh, there's some more people who who uh, find the book uh, fascinating and giving it a thumbs up. Um, there's the program for Damaloka Day, uh, which those of you who have who have long memories and were there may remember. Um, we had uh, Alicia Lawrence, myself, um, Liz Harris, who's who's here tonight, and um, Tom Tweed from Texas. Uh, in in the panel and giving presentations. Sorry, and uh, this is this is me. I, I appear to be playing playing air violin. I don't know why. Uh, this is the beginning of the conference. This is uh, Alicia, and I believe this is the moment at which she revealed something which Lawrence and I didn't know, and she had just found out, which was the date of Damaloka's ordination from Burmese sources. And there is Lawrence uh, talking about, um, I think, uh, Damaloka's uh, sort of radical, radical antecedents. And this is the panel um, discussion. There's uh, Liz Harris, who talked about Ananda Metea, who was a sort of arch enemy of uh, Damaloka in Rangoon, and, and Tom Tweed as well. And there's the audience, so you can probably pick yourself out. Now, I'm, I'm not going to go through the life of, of um, Damaloka. Um, but uh, it, it's quite a complicated one. So you have a sort of pre-monastic pre life, um, first 45 years of his life probably, which we really know very little about, and we've had to uh, really create a social history around him to say what kind of life he probably had. But then we do know about him from 1900 to 1914. So the book covers all of this. And now I'm going to just say a few words about this trial, because... Almost exactly 110 years ago, Damaloka was tried for sedition. It starts with um, a, a magistrate's hearing uh, after um, Damaloka had made three speeches in a, uh, in a Burmese town, a coastal town, um, to large audiences of local people um, at the end of October and early November. And he reportedly attacked the Christian religion and its clergy, and he usually did this. And, um, he, you know, Damaloka was very, very critical of British Empire and and the values and uh, the drinking and uh, all the all the sort of everything that went with it. And uh, he, he couldn't attack the empire because he'd just go straight to jail. But he used to attack Christianity as a kind of symbol of um, empire. So he, he used all sorts of arguments, including atheist arguments um, to um, to basically say, look, you know, Buddhism, if, if you're Burmese, you know, don't become a Christian. You should you should uh, remain a Burmese uh, Buddhist. All of this uh, these days would, would be regarded as quite controversial, but this was quite normal in, in, in the day. And of course, what he said about Christianity was nothing compared with what the uh, missionaries were saying about Buddhism and Hinduism and other religions. So according to the court records, he said, for example, the American missionary Baptists are the biggest blackguards that ever existed. Uh, Christian ministers, uh, someone's reporting, were represented as addicted to immorality and going about each with a Bible, a bottle of whiskey and a knife. And uh, this was a, a frequent re refrain representing, you know, uh, religion, uh, drink and uh, military power. And the law in those days designed for India, of which Burma was a part, um, said that if you tried to promote feelings of enmity between different classes of his majesty's subjects, for example, between Christians and Buddhists, then uh, you could uh, be punished. Oh, there's someone else, Jim Larkin. Now, you know, the Dublin lockout and labour organiser and there is a story about Jim Larkin, or which links Jim Larkin with Damaloka in an Australian hotel, but I haven't got time to tell it now, maybe in the questions and answers. So the local magistrate bound Damaloka over for a um, thousand rupees, which is about ten thousand um, pounds, two of those. And uh, that, being bound over is basically behave yourself or those people who put up the ten thousand uh, for you will lose their money. And uh, he appealed, or his lawyers appealed, and two months later, in this rather impressive, very newly built building, the chief court in Burma, uh, he was, um, he, his appeal was heard, his hearing was heard, uh, in front of Mr. Justice Toomey. Um, Justice Toomey is, I'm glad to say, a local man, court man, um, and uh, he 
Uh, so our book actually starts with this rather extraordinary uh, situation of the, the, the monk, the Irish monk dressed in yellow with a shaved head uh, facing Mr Justice Toomey, the Irish judge, with um, an elaborate wig and a black gown. So um, Toomey, I mean, I won't go into detail, but he was born in Carrick Tuil in uh, Blake House, uh, as pronounced, and um, he's grandfather of, of the very famous anthropologist Professor, Professor Mary Douglas. Now, this is a complicated page, but the key things here, if you look at the map on the right, um, the, the, on, the, uh, on the extreme right um, is the Fitch Square, which was absolutely thronged with people in front of the courthouse. Um, and these people were Damaloka supporters, and they were not only Buddhist, they were all kinds of people, the shopkeepers, the workers, the, the dock workers, and so forth. You can see this is the map of Rangoon at the time. You can see that uh, all of this is... Um, this is the, um, you know, the river port. And uh, then the, the other circle is uh, where Damaloka's monastery was located. It was a whole um, bunch of monasteries. And uh, as it says, uh, you know, everybody poured in and um, a good defence fund was collected and so forth. And in fact, the crowd was so great that Toomey uh, rather uh, cannily uh, deferred the hearing for a week. And um, finally, judgment was given on the 31st of January. And his decision was that the application is dismissed. In other words, the appeal fails, the sureties have to be uh, paid into the court. And he said that, um, you know, Colvin was actually trying to influence people, uh, which was a crime. So um, Damaloka wrote to a friend and said, my case has exercised a great stir in Burma, but my reputation has not suffered in the least by the prosecution. It's given me a big boost. Um, he didn't actually go back to Burma, though, after that. He, he, he was quite active for um, uh, at least another couple of years, um, but he, he didn't go back to Burma, um, probably because it, uh, they were planning to re-arrest him uh, as, soon as, his, um, as soon as his one year of being bound over uh, expired. So if you want to know more about this, um, you can buy the book or you can look at the Damaloka project and uh, the Damaloka project is on WordPress and uh, it it's, has a lot of information, not just about Damaloka, but all kinds of related things, particularly uh, once we start, once we found Damaloka, we actually found dozens um, of early Western Buddhists. And in fact, uh, three days ago, was it three or four days ago, we, for the first time, we actually found a picture of a Western Buddhist, an Austrian, who was ordained in 1876, 1878. Uh, not just a picture, but a name. Uh, so we think from the book, all sorts of um, discoveries are going to be generated. There's somebody else who thinks that the Irish Buddhist would make an excellent Christmas present, either to give or to receive. And there we go. So that's me. Thank you very much. Um, it's very weird talking to a a screen with no feedback, but I'm now going to pass over to um, Alicia. So Alicia, are you there? I am. You need I to am. unmute. Yeah, good. Okay. Go ahead, Thanks. Alicia. Thanks. Uh, if you can go ahead and switch the PowerPoint. Uh, thank you, Brian, for this. This is, it's really fun to be here. Um, and this is, it is very much a celebration. Um, the first slide that Brian had with the picture of UCC actually had these very warm memories coming up in me because in many ways, it feels like for us, the project is coming home because the early days of the project from Demoloka Day and then other times, it was really at, at Cork where we would meet, um, where we would get together. Um, and, and so I have all of these fond memories of this and it feels like the appropriate place to, to launch this book into the world. Um, but it also feels like coming home because as I look through the people who are here on the on the talk today, um, I realize how many friends that I've met and gotten connected with through this project, um, how we've kind of created a really interesting community and group of people working on similar things. Um, and also the ways in which I got to know the, the Department for the Study of Religion at Cork through Brian first. Um, and I still say it's one of my favorite departments for the study of religion anywhere. I think you guys have an amazing approach and and really a serious engagement. Um, and so kind of times we've had together uh, beginning to look at these things. I want to talk to you a little bit um, just to put Burma, uh, Demoloka in context of colonial Burma. Um, I think 
since a lot of you are friends and lots of you have heard bits and pieces of this over the years, uh, I, I think we won't tell you new stories or won't tell you tell you the stories that are in the book, but um, just to tell you maybe a bit about what I learned out of this process or, or what came to me about the study of religion through thinking about Damaloka specifically and specifically in Burma. Can you do the next slide? Um, so I think there's a bit to think about. Brian, can you advance the PowerPoint? Okay. Um, there's a bit to think about in terms of Damaloka uh, in the context of colonial Burma and the turn of the 20th century. So I think it's important in many ways to think about what was the political, the economic, um, the sort of larger context in which he appears. And it's very much the height of British colonialism in Southeast Asia. At this point, Burma is part of India, so it's part of the British Raj of India. Um, and the tensions of colonialism as, as we're really clear in the book, are global at this point, right? The Irish experience of colonialism is connected to the British experience of colonialism. And the connections back and forth between colonies, I think, are much more important than we might have seen. And Demoloka brings that to the fore, right? He helps us understand what it is that the colonial experience uh, of Irish people in diaspora, the colonial experience of Irish people in Ireland relates to the colonial experience of people in Burma. And he's explicit about that. He has a message that goes out to the world. Um, next slide. Uh, he, we get asked a lot, was Dumaloka a real monk? Uh, you know, was he really a monk in this context? And the, the short answer is absolutely, and probably more so than a lot of the other Western, well, uh, more so than some of the other Western Buddhists ordained around him and after him, in the sense that when he goes on these preaching missions and, and he's beloved by people in the Burmese countryside, thousands of people show up to his to his preaching events. Um, they escort him in parades as he comes into town. Women spread out their hair for him to walk on. But when he does, he stays at the local monastery. He gets up in the morning, he collects alms like the monks here, um, and in every way, the Burmese lay people, Burmese Buddhist lay people, as an arbiter of who's a real monk, who's a normal monk, would say that Damaloka is absolutely a monk. He performs the role, but he performs the role in a very normal way. He's not a normal preacher in any regard. He's uh, over the top and, and excited in many ways, but he gives you that. Um, and then if you move to the next slide. But I think the other thing we learned about um, the, thinking through Damaloka, through his story about the study of religion, or one of the things I really learned working with Brian and Lawrence is how to think about the study of religion slightly differently. Because even if we have these romantic, beautiful images of Buddhism, you know, the sort of images I've given you here, we also need to remember that Rangoon, that Burma is a place of working people. Um, it's a place where people live real lives and work real jobs, and the colonialism was very much an exploitative system. Um, and in that way, this project turned my mind to thinking about the study of religion and intersections with class, and thinking about what it meant to be working class broadly within a colonial context, whether you be European, um, right, white, white poor people and white working class people, or you be Burmese or Indian or Chinese or something else. Uh, and I think that's one of the real takeaways from the project and the book is how do we think about class in the study of religion and how does having an attention to class actually show us a huge other world that the discussions of Buddhism in Burma before this really didn't have at all. And if you move forward to the next slide, um, and more than that, I think it also really taught us that we need to think about connections and mobility in the study of religion. So we had Tom tweet at Damaloka Day because he thinks about connections and flows in the study of religion. But I think really thinking about sailors in particular, starting from Damaloka as a sailor and thinking about who his life, what his life world would have been like, taught me something really different about how you think about the study of religion from the actual experiences of the figures they're talking about. Not the, not texts, not abstractions, but what would it have been like physically? Who would you have talked to? What would your networks have been? And it's very clear that those networks are what make Damaloka's work possible. And the next slide. Um, and then also to think about monks as real people. 
I think it's easy when we're teaching an uh, introductory class to talk about texts and ideas and abstractions and ideals, but actually the monks who put those forward are real human beings with real politics, real engagement. Um, and I think Damaloka really brings those people into view for us. I think we're able to see both working class folks, sailors, this kind of engagement, but also the monastic community as engaged in its own kinds of things. Um, and then move on to the next slide. Uh, and then what it really, I think the Damaloka project taught me as much as anything is to think about religion in motion and the ways in which the connections between people were much greater at the turn of the 20th century than our history books or our ways of thinking about it happen. Lagoon was a cosmopolitan port connected to other cosmopolitan ports throughout Southeast Asia, India, across Asia. And these interconnections and these cross Asian conversations were happening and were much richer in shaping what we now think of as world religions at that moment than I think we had any inkling of when we started this project. 10 years ago, I wouldn't have known to look at this but today, this picture with the life teeming and the different kinds of shipping, the different kinds of lifeways that are happening in Rangoon, I think actually captures a lot of Damaloka's world. And, and through that, I think it really pushed us to think differently about how we study religion, what kinds of sources we think about, what kind of engagements. Um, and then the last slide. And I think Damaloka also really taught us more than anything um, to think in terms of, of Buddhism and the study of Buddhism in a context that's multi-ethnic, multicultural, and multi-religious, and to think of past our assumptions of boundaries between religions to inter-ethnic collaborations for Buddhist projects, to think about inter-religious collaborations, the ways in which people came together across the lines that we now perceive as very stark colonizer, colonized, Asian, European, you know, Buddhist, Hindu, Muslim, and to actually see much greater connections, collaborations, and more fluidity in those lines. Um, and so I'm, after a decade of doing this, I'm a changed as a scholar. Um, I'm changed as a person with these amazing friends um, and really an amazing collaboration. I couldn't ask for, for two more wonderful people to work with and get to know um, in this process. And, and changed in the ways in which I study and think about religion. Um, Damaloka has given us that gift. I think actually in some ways it's a celebration of him, you know, it's a biography, but it's really a celebration of kind of what he's been able to do for us. Uh, so with that, I wanna thank you and I'll hand it on over to Lawrence. Okay, well, thank you. And uh, I mean, taking on from that, I think one thing that really comes out thinking about Damaloka is how similar the world uh, of the Buddhist revival, uh, the moment which gives us Buddhism as a world religion, in inverted commas, is to our own academic world, in the sense that it's a world driven by international meetings, driven by the production of journals, uh, driven by people zipping around on steamships and so on. Uh, we were messing about earlier with the technology, and I was thinking about Anagarika Dharmapala in Ceylon, who I'll talk about in a sec, who uh, loved the new technology so much that when he was campaigning on his own, he would go around in an ox cart with a gramophone and a sheet to project magic lantern slides on. So this kind of technophilia of how do we do this stuff? What can we do with these new connections? And then these new constraints, you know, maybe getting slung in jail for saying the wrong thing. Uh, Damaloka himself, uh, I often think, because I do the Twitter account for Damaloka, Damaloka would have loved Twitter. And when we're uh, thinking about his newspaper polemics, his many pseudonyms, uh, his opponents and so on, it's a very social media world. But I want to talk particularly about one experience. Brian, if you can give us the next slide. Uh, where these two guys come together uh, and Anagarika Dharmapala, who is a uh, Sinhalese, Sri Lankan, Buddhist reformer, radical, founder of the Mahabodhi Society, gets Damaloka, our guy, over to give a tour. There's Dharmapala top right. 
Uh, and they go on this really quite breakneck tour in the space of a little more than two months. They do 48 talks and that's with breaks for sickness. They'd originally scheduled pretty much a talk a day, ranging over a good chunk of Sri Lanka. And they are talking in Buddhist temples and seminaries, Buddhist Theosophical Society schools, many of them founded by John Bowles Daly, Irishman, uh, in market and municipal halls. Damaloka is lecturing, he is giving Pansil, the refuges and precepts, to crowds of between 700 and 5,000. And Dharmapala, as the organiser, is noting in his diary, we had good dana, so we collected a lot of money, or the book sales were pretty good. And I love this stuff because I'm a scholar of social movements. I'm interested in how people mobilise. No, the next slide would be great, actually. Thanks, Brian. Uh, I'm interested in how people do this stuff very practically. And this tour is fantastic. Um, Mihirini Sirisena uh, did a lot of the field work for it, and uh, I want to thank her for this, because she dug out so many different viewpoints. This is a period of religious polemic, but often we only get to hear it in one or two ways. For this tour, Dharmapala's newspaper, Sinhala Bodhaya, and I apologize for my pronunciation, gives not only the tour schedules, but transcriptions of some of Damaloka's talks. Dharmapala, as the organizer, he's got his own backstage diaries, which are very, very illuminating. The colonial press, the missionary press, attack it relentlessly. Uh, some other Buddhist organizations distance themselves. We see the police and other officials engaging in surveillance, and we're aware there's some other sources out there. So there was a special issue, kind of commemorative issue, of uh, Dharmapala's newspaper all about the tour. Uh, a colonial illustrated weekly had an anti Damaloka cartoon. So you really get to see the working parts of this, which is great fun as much as anything else. Um, so why is there so much attention? Why is uh, Damaloka a controversial guy? Well, he says things like this first statement. The Christian missionaries who came to the Maori advised them to look up, the, up at the sky and pray to God, and then you'll be blessed. But the Maori said, when we look up and pray, you steal the earth beneath our feet. Yeah. This still resonates. This is a powerful thing to say. It is a powerful thing when Dharma, Dhammaloka, as a Buddhist monk, draws out not just the violent passages in the Old Testament, but connects them to European military violence. Uh, it's powerful when he disconnects the claim that colonialism is good because it brings you both modernity, so health, science, education, women's rights, and so on, and the gospel. And he says, well, actually, you know, this Bible, it's not so scientific. It's not so logical or coherent. And actually in Europe, it's on the opposite side to modernity and progress. And he's very taken with conflicts in Spain around this point between uh, anarchists, secularists, free thinkers and so on, and uh, a Catholic dominated state. And he's prone to say the kind of thing that got him uh, in trouble more than once, which is basically to say, look, colonialism, they'll come for you with the Bible, missionary Christianity. They'll come for you with the whiskey bottle, cultural destruction. They'll come for you with the Gatling gun, military conquest. So this is shocking stuff. And in some ways, the tour comes across as nothing so much as like a heavy metal band touring the Bible Belt uh, in the early 1970s. There is an intention to shock. There are people who are lapping it up and there are people who are horrified. Next slide, please. Uh, so even before he gets there, there are letters to the newspaper from Burma saying this guy is trouble. Um, the newspapers, the colonial and missionary ones, say he's preaching sedition. They call for him to be deported. We have the police and various local government officials turning up to ostentatiously take notes of what he says in case they can get up a prosecution. We've got Christian missionaries doing their own counter lectures. And these totally 
1909 moments, Damaloka is lecturing and a guy comes in, a Christian lay preacher with a tom-tom drum, disturbing the meeting. And Dharmapala challenges him, they have a religious debate, and because he loses the debate, he gives Dharmapala his Bible. Now, this is a world in which people take religious argument and these kinds of trophies very seriously, and that works both ways. Uh, next slide, please. So there's a lot of pressure from outside. There's this very punishing schedule. You can see an example on the left. And backstage, they are pretty much fighting with each other, throwing the TV out of the window and so on. So uh, in October, one Friday, Dharmapala turns up at the office. They're they go out and they come back. And Damaloka suddenly says, well, I'm leaving Ceylon this evening. And Dharmapala is tearing his hair out. He goes, this is Heterachi, who's one of his own guys. He, he's made a mess of it. And he racks his brains and he gives D Damaloka a razor, one of the new safety razors, which is a razor is one of the few things a Buddhist monk can own. And the safety razor is a new high status thing. So it's not just, oh, nice, I can shave my hair without you know, getting blood all over me. It's a prestigious gift. He smooths things over. Uh, but his number two, Harris Chandra, is pretty jealous. It would, you know, Damaloka, he's unclean. He's provoked, easily provoked to anger. The only good thing about him is he can rattle away for hours against Christianity. So there's all of this tension going on in the backstage. And then it comes together in November of 1909, 111 years ago, last slide. Once again, a month later, Dabaloka turns up all of a sudden, I have to leave Ceylon this evening. I absolutely cannot stay. And Dharmapala is grinding his teeth because uh, he's got an arrangement to get this guy to Naboda. And he says, the Irish nature manifests itself most unexpectedly. Now, we're not quite sure what it is uh, that sends Dab Dabaloka packing. There is a report that the Legislative Council, the local parliament has passed a bill directly targeting open air preachers who vilify other people's religion. It could be that, or it could be part of this wider wave of repression that's hitting Indian nationalists, uh, that is starting to hit in Britain and Ireland as well in this period. There's increasing concern about security, imperial power is no longer so secure, but one way or another, Damaloka decides it's time to leave. And with that, I think we leave our presentation as well. Thank you very much, uh, Lawrence and Alicia. And uh, I'm, I'm going to hand back to Jenny now and I'll close this um, slide down so that we can have a, we've got about 40 minutes, I think, for questions and answers. And Jenny knows who's asking questions, so we'll leave it to her to convey the questions to the panel. So um, I'd like to, to thank all of you, Brian, uh, Alicia and Lawrence. I, I, um, I'm sure everybody will, will want to read more in the book. So I'll stop the recording now.